Um, so I'm sorry, I have to take control of this here. I, I would like to say logistically, um, some people have used the social hour software effectively. Um, as Lee just said, the purpose of this conference is for people to meet each other. Uh, the, I know there is a problem with Zoom chat. You can't see who all of the attendees are and you can't chat them directly. Um, I, if you're, if you're willing to, I suggest you just post in the chat your email and someone can, and what you wanna know about. You can also go to the Slack channel uh, that Sirius Global is supporting. You can find the link at the top of our website. And then after this meeting or now, if you want, you can go to the social hour software, which is a video chat where all of you attendees will be able to speak, not, not a lecture hall like this webinar is. Um, because I, I think a lot of great things have happened during this conference. I don't want someone to leave without an email address that they want to get. Um, although, you know, we need to respect people's privacy in some way. Leith apparently doesn't care about her privacy. She just put this up, which is great. Way to go, Leith, thank you. Um, so now at, at the risk of being rude, that is kind of my job. I'm gonna jump into the next panel and I, I, I may call on some of the panelists here because this is a fascinating conversation, but I, I assure you, we're gonna to try to keep it to 20 um, minutes. So I, I have some, uh, I need to apologize. Uh, Renata um, Nechkova, Nechkovska, um, her, uh, Dr. Nechkovska cannot be here because Zoom does not work in her country. And we didn't realize that until recently. She sent in an audio answer to the questions that I prepared ahead of time, but I have not had time to review it and it's too long for me to play it. So I apologize that she cannot participate in this final panel. The other people um, that we have here that I'd like to, to introduce are Andrew Lamb, who is a Shuttleworth fellow, and I believe is interested in massive small scale manufacturing or massive small manufacturing. Hopefully he'll tell us about that. He works for Field Ready. Uh, I've been in a number of meetings with Andrew. My belief is Field Ready, like Joe and like Richa, is on the ground in a number of places. Um, uh, Andrew, are you here? Uh, maybe you just come hi. on. Hi, hi, Robert. Good to uh, be here. I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions in a minute, and then I'd like to introduce Professor Joshua Pierce, who is a uh, professor at Michigan Tech and is an advocate of open source appropriate technology. And um, I prepared a number of questions ahead of time for these gentlemen and Renata to answer. And I'd like to change that script based on what we just had. And I kind of like to have this panel um, that Leith and Richa and Amish and Florin were having roll into the, the, the new panel, if, if you don't mind. Um, so first of all, um, I, I think it's important that we realize that money matters, okay? It, it's very important to have funding for these efforts. On the other hand, the maker community does have to stand up in certain ways, okay? The, if, if I see one more fake lightsaber or TARDIS shaped earrings, I, you know, I'm gonna puke. Of course, no one's gonna give you $100,000 if you're spending your time making toy lightsabers, right? You know, what, we, what the maker community needs to do is to meet the funding community halfway by showing that it has a mature testing regime. And I don't mean perfection by that, but a mature, trustable testing regime for the things that it develops. They have to show that they've listened to Pierre Longchamp's lectures and they understand the regulatory environment. Not that they have mastered it, but that they're taking steps to understand it. Um, and finally, before I ask these gentlemen a question, I, I would like to make a personal plea that we also be friendly to for-profit firms. And here is the mantra that I would like to use for that. I would like to say, we're for-profits, but not monopolies, okay? So when we choose open source licenses for our material, we are not excluding the possibility of people making profits. I hope people make a lot of money from public invention devices. What they're not allowed to do is to exclusively make money from it. 
to take the device, monopolize it, and say, we own it and no one else can make it. Or to say, for example, unlikely to occur, but to, you know, to say, we in India can make it and we can make it our, our improvement and you in Africa can't make it because we have some legal reason that you can't make it. Okay. Um, so Andrew, you, you've heard Leith and Richa talk about these things. I probably haven't done a good job introducing you. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a chance to introduce yourself. What is your vision for what we as a community could do differently, let's say two years from now? Like how could we be ready either for a variant of um, COVID-19? You know, I personally believe the two most frightening words in the world are um, starter pandemic, right? The possibility that this was just a warm up of the big one. Uh, and, and so I'd like to give you free range to answer the question. How, how would things be different two years from now if you had your druthers? Thank you for having me today. And um, yeah, really, really impressive discussion um, over the last couple of hours. So I really appreciated that. I'm also really excited to be sharing a panel uh, with Joshua, who um, uh, in the middle of March 2020, I was en route to see Joshua um, up in Michigan Tech when it became apparent that traveling uh, was not the thing to do. And so uh, at, at least we've got some time later um, to talk about these things. Um, Field Ready's work is all about trying to locally manufacture aid supplies. It's um, about trying to uh, fix medical devices. Um, so we're you know, fixing medical devices in Syria or in um, uh, Fiji. We're manufacturing PPE um, with local factories in Bangladesh or in Kenya. Um, we are, you know, local manufacturing aid supplies. Uh, basically, we operate maker spaces and train up local people, and we um, design open hardware aid supplies. Um, one of the big, I think, to answer your question, Robert, um, we have to recognise what's happened in the last twelve months. Um, I would say that uh, we don't, we no longer need to make the case as an organisation that local manufacturing is the way to go in the aid sector. I, everybody, everybody is on board with that now. Uh, there are concerns. A lot of those concerns have been discussed in this event. Uh, and, and there are barriers and those barriers have been concerned as well. We don't need to argue for it anymore. We don't need to campaign almost for it anymore. We need to campaign against certain aspects of it and we'll come to that later. Um, but. Now people are coming to Field Ready. UNICEF is coming to Field Ready. Oxfam is coming to see Field Ready, UNDP, saying, you know that local manufacturing thing that you were talking about? We, we could do with that now. <laughs> Can you help, please? Um, now, we, I think one of the things that we've also seen is maker spaces have become parts of critical infrastructure. They've been recognized as places that need to stay open if you want certain supplies to be made. And certainly Field Ready's maker spaces in the South Pacific and Iraq have had certifications that allow them to stay open during national lockdowns. Um, I think um, the question is how, in the next two years we need to figure out the how, of how we're going to implement that change. There was some conversation from Leith and um, Florin in the previous uh, session previous panel which was about payment and procurement and um the loosening of restrictions and so on it's it's a um an area that i'm trying to get much more involved in i'm trying to start an initiative called the local procurement learning partnership which is basically about trying to um help the aid sector learn and the aid agencies learn how to buy local, you know, and, and what the target product profiles that Florin was talking about, um, you know, to make sure that those are written in a way that items can be made locally and procured locally. At the moment, we have crazy situations where basic hand washing supplies that may be made in Vanuatu have to be shipped to Bangkok to be put in boxes, the wash kits, to then be shipped back to Vanuatu for distribution. 
Why? <laughs> just buy in Vanuatu and distribute locally. It's, we're talking about soap here. Like, what's going on? So, you know, trying to help the ASECL learn how to do local procurement so that there is a market so you can build commercial entities around open hardware. And for, for local manufacturers, for young entrepreneurs, um, in the demographic dividends that so many countries are facing, this, this is absolutely the way that they're going to be making their livings. Um, so I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I think basically we're, we're, it, it's now about us moving on to the conversation of how, um, how we're going to implement rather than, um, which we've started in, in the, the, your conference today, Robert, um, rather than necessarily, you know, needing to make the case. Uh, I've got more to say, but you know, honestly, let me let me move on to Josh. That's a, a good direction. I, I would like to try to finish at two twenty so we can go to the social social hour. Although this is a fascinating conversation, but there's no way we can cover everything. We, but we yeah. need to keep the conversations going. So, Professor Pierce, um, uh, you're a professor at Michigan Tech, and I believe. Uh, even a, a year ago, you had created a testing lab to try to provide what might be called third-party testing for some things. You're also the chief editor of Hardware X, which I consider to be one of the main venues for the publication of, of serious peer-reviewed open source um, devices, maybe not masks and gowns, but the kind of electromechanical devices that we've been, been talking about um, here. Um, Andrew just asked the question from the point of view of local manufacturer, uh, but in some cases design precedes manufacture. So I, I'd like to ask you, Professor Pierce, how you, you, what could we do differently to be ready for the next pandemic two years from now? Sure. Uh, thank you, Robert, and thank you for for having me. And it's it's also an honor to to be on the committee or on the the panel with with Andrew. If if you can think of uh, Andrew and Field Ready as sort of the the double O sevens of this type of work, I'm more like the Q. So the guy back in the lab with a bunch of students. Um, I I think we we are at a turning point. And if COVID did anything really good for the open hardware community, it's to let every the rest of the world understand the power of distributed manufacturing. I kind of came at it from the scientific perspective where I got frustrated with proprietary equipment and being able to change it and it being just simply too expensive and started leaning more and more heavily on the maker community and using things like Arduinos and open source 3D printers to make my own equipment. And when I started, there was, there was almost no one really doing this in a serious way. And I got an article in science and a book that followed after. And now I can honestly say it's a real thing. Um, many scientists are making their own tools not just because they're less costly, but because they're able to be customized and superior. And that same thing that we learned in the scientific community is applicable to basically everybody. You can do distributed manufacturing of digital design and make something you can be in the most rural section in the world. Like I'm in a rural community here. We have, you know, for the US, we have problems with access to tools. Um, you talk about some place like in the rural areas of India, it's, it's much worse. Uh, but if you have access to some basic fundamental building tools, solar powered 3D printers, the ability to recycle some of the materials uh, within your own community and turn them into to products. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, everything from you know, tools and scientific tools uh, to uh, medical hardware, that is the future. And so for moving us in that direction, I'm a very strong proponent of, we have to professionalize this. And so it is fantastic that the maker community came out by the tens of thousands and provided, as we heard in the, the last talk, hundreds of millions of dollars of value to the global community. That's amazing. And what made it largely possible in the US was what the NIH did. They had a, already had an existing 3D print exchange, which was a, a place where we shared open designs. They saw that there was going a major problem kind of coming to pass in the US. We were all kind of freaking out a year ago. And they set it up so that the VA and the FDA and themselves could vet technologies that the maker community came up with. And then it was posted on their website with sort of a, this is okay for the community or this is okay for kind of a, a hospital um, use. And even though most of that 
most of those technologies were relatively low tech when we weren't to the ventilator stage yet. It made it possible so, for them to be used. The hospitals in the US and I, I think for most of the rest of the world are extremely afraid to take on new technologies like we've discussed here. And the FDA specifically forbids what we're talking about, which is distributed manufacturing. You have to not only be FDA approved for the device, but you have to be FDA approved as a manufacturer. And I don't know that anyone has really gotten there other than the, the bigger companies. That's the part that has to change. I don't want them to reduce the regulations. I'm happy to meet any technical requirement, I'm, but I want it to be able to be produced by anyone as long as they meet those requirements. And so, uh, uh, Robert, what you were talking about with having open methods of vetting technologies is extremely important. So for what we can do for next time, we need to have labs funded to do open hardware development. And in the beginning of the policy talk, we talked about how um, billions of dollars were given to, to proprietary companies to build vaccines. There is zero reason those should not have been come with a demand that the vaccines were open sourced. And that goes for all the technologies. There's a really, really sad story of how the US government did try to fund a low cost ventilator company basically did it, but they got purchased by another company that then locked it down. And we never, we never got it. It still doesn't exist. There's, I mean, we're in 2021 now, all of the technologies that we're talking about are well explained, well understood. I mean, if you look at what we've done in ventilators, there's literally like a hundred ventilators that are all okay with a little bit more effort and, and TLC, they could get to the point that you could manufacture them and use them in hospitals. And so some have, there's no reason we shouldn't have that for every single technology. Funding agencies need to start funding it specifically, and we're already starting to see movement in that direction. Uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is trying to basically eradicate all diseases or at least find a, uh, you know, a way to manage them, had an open hardware conference last month where they are, I mean, they're major funders and they get open science. They understand why we should share all of the information that we have. There's zero reason that we shouldn't be starting to do that on the hardware side, uh, as we've already seen kind of open software to take over the entire market. And so that I think is, is something that we, those of you that are kind of listening now can help with. If you have any control over purchasing, demand open source. If you have any control over funding, demand that it's open source. Um, I've seen more and more calls uh, for like reviews of open source hardware. We now, you know, open hardware X is one of the, the largest and best instrumentation journals and everything you do there has to be open source. We don't even look at it if it's not. Um, and I get asked to review papers all the time and I'm also starting to be more and more asked to review um, calls for proposals that came from academics mostly, that they're, they're trying to answer a proposal by pr proposing something that's open source. But what I haven't seen a lot of is the actual calls for proposals from the funding agencies demanding that the technology is open source. And so that's our next step. I think we're well on the way. What the NIH did for the US, uh, the UN is thinking about doing for the entire rest of the world and building an open source database. And that has the um, sort of support of both UNCTAD and um, ECOSOC. So we, we've got major players that are now listening to this kind of open source development as a real tool uh, for solving medical crises like the one we're in now. And there's no reason that we as kind of the maker community can't be supporting that. Okay. I want the people in the audience though to leave with something they can take action on. And I know some of those people are makers or engineers like myself, and they're not policy makers and they don't have decision-making power and so forth. Um, so my question, and maybe Leith could take a stab at answering this is, you know, what can the maker community do to convince the people who have a lot of money to do what Dr. Pierce just described, which is to fund testing laboratories and other development efforts? So there's a very small group of funders who prop up you know, glo global health. Sorry, there you go. Um, global health. Um, it's a few large governments like the US government is back in play now as a major global health funder. Um, a handful of European governments, Canada, um, Japan is quite generous. And then you have private foundations like uh, Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, some research, NIH, and a few other research. There's not very many. You could count them on, you know, two hands. 
Uh, you need to have um, direct conversations with them at the highest level as a movement. So if you could round up, is there an international association of makers, collectors or something? Is there, is there such a body? Um, bring all the best, the most powerful maker communities together in some kind of international um, collaborative and go to the major donors and sit down one by one saying, this is who we are, this is what we can do. This is the kind of financing we need to really get the best value out of this extraordinary network of inventors. And you should invest in us. So you, you have to have, a, you'll have to have a proposal, you know, a very concrete proposal like Joshua's recommendations just there were just great. You wanna see that in a document. Um, with specific financial ask, and then bring your most powerful leaders together from, from every maker collective. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, Andrew, back, back to you, maybe. Um, so, uh, tell us more about what, you, what you've done in Syria and, and how we can, so, so we just had an answer that's a policy answer. Right. Can you give us more of a boots on the ground answer to this question? How can we make ourselves more relevant? Um, well, first of all, Leif, I think uh, you're spot on. Joshua is um, uh, inspirational in his comments there. But um, so I, I fully endorse and support what they've said. And I'm very happy to help with uh, making those demands and making those um, engagements with uh, big funders. Um, what we need is, first of all, if I may uh, be so bold, is um, the maker movement to listen to Pierre Longchamp, to listen to, um, to you, Robert, when you said interfaces matter more than implementations. Um, at least when you were talking about a new generation of technologies that are made locally, designed locally, Richard, when you were talking about an open distributed network of local people, you know, that, that this is what we need to be building. And then, but the, and, and that vision of, um, uh, you know, the critical making, making with purpose, um, making that matters. We need more open hardware designs. My colleagues in Syria have demand uh, in Northwest Syria, uh, are, are visiting hospitals, writing lists of all the broken equipment and prioritizing what needs to be made. Uh, what, need, what needs to be produced and you know we have quite a difficult triage process really to decide what we can do and what uh, what's most most impactful and so on um, what they need is a series of a, a really big database of open hardware designs because the more time that they spend designing the less time they spend making and if you're not making things you're not helping people so, um, so we need a really big database of designs. I would encourage everyone to use the open know-how, open know-how data standard. I nearly said open nowhere, which is a mapping standard, but the open know-how data standard um, is a way to discover documentation for hardware online, design documentation. So open knowhow.org, create your manifest wherever you've got your designs saved put a manifest uh, facing the, the, uh, the internet, facing the outside world and a crawler will search for it. Field Ready's engineers use those search engines to find documentation of, of things, of products, medical devices that are already designed. So we need more designs at the ready. We need more designs that are certified. So I'm really, really pleased to be working with um, people like Nigel Daly from Helpful Engineering here in the UK, who has managed to uh, certify um, some medical devices, people like GLIA, um, G-L-I-A dot org, um, who have um, Health Canada certified devi devices and Health Canada certified manufacturing facilities in places like Gaza um, that are making critical supplies. Um, so I'm, you know, those, we need more of that. And, um, uh, you know, what we're building up towards is what I would describe as an internet of production. I, we have an alliance called the Internet of Production Alliance, internetofproduction.org, where we're trying to bring together 
um, a series of data standards that enable distributed decentralized manufacturing. So, um, you know, use the open know-how data standard under the Internet of Production Alliance to publish your designs. Use the open nowhere data standard to say where the machines are so we know what can be made where. <laughs> and it would, and our engineers in Syria uh, will be able to suddenly <laughs> spend far less time on design, more time on making. Okay, thank you.